Good morning. So I'm going to get this out of the way first and foremost. Most of you know I was in a car accident this week. I'm fine. <laughs> um, I've had a lot of love this week, and I appreciate it very much. My car, not so fine, but uh, my car's replaceable, <laughs> more replaceable. Um, so today we are in the third week of our series, uh, The Bible Doesn't Say That, and um, this week we're talking about suffering always coming from sin. This is really loud. Hello? Let me get that turned down a little bit. Okay. Um, and first and foremost, I want to say, I'm pretty sure that I got to do this last year too. I think I preached on Mother's Day last year, but I get to call out my two favorite mothers are here today. My mother, Joanne, woo! And my bestest friend in the world, Chrissy Baxter, woo! <laughs> and many other mothers, which I love. I will not name you all or we will... I will have no time for a sermon. Um, so uh, I just want to say, though, happy Mother's Day to everybody. Um, you all are more appreciated than you know, which is our fault, I guess. Um, so I am going to pray before we get started, and then we'll, get, we'll dive right in, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you so much for today. God, I thank you for uh, the blessing of being able to uh, lead and teach this morning, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you, um, Lord, first and foremost, uh, that they would be right in your sight, God. I thank you for each person here, especially for our mothers this morning, um, Lord, whether they're here with us in body or in spirit, Lord, or whether they're, they're celebrating with you, Lord, we just, we thank you for them and for the lives that they've given us and that you have given us through them, Lord. And I just pray a special blessing over them today, God. I thank you for your provision and for guiding me safely through this week, Lord. I thank you um, for airbags and for um, well-made cars. <laughs> we thank you um, for this time that we are about to ha uh, just receive your word. And Lord, I pray that it would be um, something of you and from you that each person here would walk away a little bit different um, than when they walked in these doors this morning, Lord. And may that be through your power, not through any clever or smart thing I may have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, are we good? It's a little echoey. All right. So, I struggled a little bit with this sermon this week, um, not for lack of content, but for... Um, with this idea of suffering always comes from sin. Uh, there is some truth in that. Suffering sometimes comes from sin, right? Um, the problem is, really, that the Bible doesn't have a ton to say about where sin comes from. I mean, it definitely does. Don't get me wrong. But it has a lot more to say about how we react to suffering than where our suffering comes from. And so... The easy answer, the simple answer, is suffering is a part of life. It doesn't always come from sin, but it always comes from somewhere. Um, and Jesus himself said that. He said um, in John chapter 16, verse 20, and I actually skipped, so it's verse 20 and verse 33. Um, he says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. I have told the, you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So that's it, that's the sermon. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> um, it's a fact of life. Uh, Jesus said it. And that pretty much settles it. Um, you will have trouble in this world. And being a follower of Jesus does not exempt you from that. In fact, pretty much guarantees more of the, the trouble than less. Um, but the best part is that last part. Uh, I have overcome the world. Amen. That's the best thing. That's the, the best news I can give you this morning. Um, and so the idea kind of came to me, what exactly are we, do we talk about when we're talking about suffering? Suffering is kind of a churchy word. I feel like most people don't go around going, oh, I'm suffering. I am suffering so much. No, we don't say that. So 
It's a little bit small, but this is the definition of suffering um, or to suffer as the verb. So the noun is a state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardship. And as a verb, to experience or be subjected to something bad or unpleasant. So how many of you in your life have experienced suffering? Y'all better raise your hands, you're not paying attention. How many of you have experienced suffering? Yes, there we go. How many of you think it's all your fault, the suffering that you've experienced? No, absolutely not. I hate to break it to you, you don't get that much credit for your life. Um, suffering is a state of undergoing something or being subjected to something that is less than ideal. And in a funny way, it reminds me of when I went to Bible college. Um, so when I went to Bible college, I went for one year, and they call it the greenhouse effect, right? So I went to Bible college, and I lived, breathed, slept, and dreamed Bible. It's a very intensive experience. And what it does is it grows your faith really quickly, really deeply. So my roots went up, and my, my self went up, and my roots went down. My roots didn't go up. My roots went down. My self went up, right? And you grow a very large, very strong plant quickly. That's what a greenhouse does. But the only way that you can do that is by subjecting a plant, or in this case, a person, to an experience that is much more intense than what you normally would find in nature. And by doing that, you do experience a fair amount of suffering, right? Those are the things that make the plant grow. They're the things that make the roots grow. By meeting that resistance, you become a better version of yourself. And suffering does have several sources. If you kind of sift it out through the Bible, you'll find several different sources, and they basically come down to these five things. We live in a broken world. Uh, Adam and Eve screwed that up for us. <laughs> you know, they made a choice that we prob somebody, we all would have made, right? So they broke the world. We live in a broken world. We are, as a result, we are broken people. We screw up. We do things we shouldn't do. That's called sin. The third choice is that God is disciplining us. And this kind of goes with that greenhouse effect, right? That all of you who are mothers and who are fathers, I'm sure you have not always been the best of friends with your child. My mom is laughing. Um, <laughs> if you are a good parent, you have not always been a friend to your child because you are their parent. And... The result of that is discipline. God is our father and our mother. He is sometimes going to discipline us, um, either because we've done something wrong or because he sees some potential in us that can be better. The fourth option is other people screw up. <laughs> um, I, I would say probably the, the guy who I hit... Uh, whose car I hit, would say that I screwed up, <laughs> right? Um, and so he was impacted ne negatively because I couldn't stop in time. We, and the, the last choice is that we live out our faith, which is counter to how the world works. And the Bible has a lot to say about this, right? We take a stand. We are separate from the world. We are in, not of. We are apart. And in doing that, and that's what Jesus is talking about in this, la in this slide here, in the world you will have trouble, Right? And he's talking to his disciples here right before he dies. And he's basically telling them, look, this is going to happen and it's going to really suck. And you guys are going to scatter. You're going to go everywhere. You're going to leave me. I'm going to be all alone and then I'm going to die. And they don't really believe him. Um, and he leaves them with this message that then they come back to, right? At once they have all scattered and Peter's denied him and he's in the tomb and they're all like, what, what do we do? Hopefully... This was echoing in their brains, right? Take heart, I have overcome the world. And so to be a Christian is to guarantee that you are going to have suffering. If from no other thing than from being a follower of Jesus. I have a quote from um, thebible.org, which is a really good resource, but their articles aren't always authored, so I, don't, I really wish I knew who this person was, but I don't. Um, and it says, of course, all of these do not apply at the same time. All suffering is not, for instance, a product of our own foolishness, self-induced misery, or sin. It is true, however, that rarely does suffering not reveal, and that's kind of an awkward way of saying it, Rarely does suffering not reveal areas of need 
areas of weakness and wrong attitudes that need to be removed like dross from the gold refining process. So basically what he's saying is, regardless of where sin comes from, and it can come from any one of these different things, um, it needs to be, it not needs to be, it, is, it does, however, reveal something in all of us that we would rather not see or deal with. Um, whether that's pride or it's um, laziness or it's selfishness or it's um, desire for comfort, there are things in us that when we are met with resistance, spring up and work in a way that we would rather not see. But that is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to be refined. And no one knows this better than uh, a certain gentleman named Job. <laughs> um, and most of you, if you are familiar with the Bible at all, um, know there's this guy in the Old Testament named Job. He gets a whole book. And the whole book is basically a dialogue um, between him and some of his friends, and then God shows up at the end. And in the beginning of the book, you hear that God and Satan are chatting, and Satan says he's been looking around the earth, and he's been looking at people, and, and God says, oh, have you seen my guy, my guy Job? He's real cool. He loves me. And he's like, he's great. He's a good guy. And Satan's like, well, yeah, he's great because you give him all this stuff. He's got all these kids and all these animals, and he's just living the high life. He's totally cool. And if he wasn't like that, he wouldn't love you. And God's like, I think you're wrong. So go ahead, and you could take every, anything you want away from him. Just don't hurt him. So Satan goes back down to earth, and he does. He takes all his kids, all his, all his livestock, all his buildings, all his wealth, everything. Everything gone from him. And Job's wife says, you should just lay down and curse God and die. And Job is like, no. <laughs> he says, I, he basically says, God gives me things and God takes things away. And I came into this world naked and I'm going to leave this world naked. And I trust God no matter what happens. So then Satan goes back to God and he's like, well, it didn't work. But it's only it didn't work because you didn't let me hurt his body. Because nobody will love you if you if their body is broken. So God says, okay, fine. You can hurt his body, but you can't kill him. So then Job gets all these sores, and he's, like, using broken pottery to scrape his, like, wounds, which is just really gross. I don't know. That's a gross image to me. So he's, like, stuck in the dirt. He's, like, even the little kids are pitying him. Even the kids, like, of the neighborhood, because he doesn't have any of his own kids, are, like, that poor dude is a mess. Like, <laughs> and his friends come along, and they come because they hear all this stuff that's happened. These three guys come along. They come. They sit with Job. And eventually, finally, one of them says, dude, what did you do <laughs> that God hates you so much? And, and Job was like, I didn't do anything. I'm a, righteous, I'm a righteous guy. And his friends are like, we don't believe you. Basically, call him out on it. They're like, you must have done something because God just doesn't punish people for no reason. And Job basically comes back at him and says that they're wrong. And so it's the clearest refutation that we can have. That's a big word. It's the clearest, like, reason that we can have that suffering doesn't always come from sin. Suffering, in this case, did two things. It proved to Satan, got, uh, Job's righteousness, and it also proved to Job some of his weaknesses. Because as you get later into the book, Job really does start saying some things that are not cool. That he starts getting broken down, and he gets really weary, and he gets, he starts to think of himself in a higher position than he really should. And so then God, at the end of the book, God comes down, and he's like, you're wrong, and I love you, but I'm God, and you're not. So you don't get to call the shots. I do, because I know how all of this works, and you don't. And it's a really good book. You should read it. It's long, but it's a good book. Um, so basically, what we come down to is a righteous man who loved God, who was tested for his faith, and got a little check in his pride, right? He became a clear understanding of who God was. And really, that is kind of the point of suffering, if you want to put a point on suffering. That is really tiny. I don't know if you can actually read that. But 1 Peter, I will read it to you. 
1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says, In this greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Christ. That is the, the NIV. That up there is the New Living Translation, <laughs> which is a little bit less wordy. Basically, what it says is, you're going to be tested, and you're worth more than gold. How many of you would like to have a little more gold in your life? Hmm? Come on. Yeah. Yep. Um, so that's good news, you guys, because you have something that's worth more than gold. You have something so valuable in you that God wants to bring it out. He wants to refine it. And by doing that, you are just going to have to be a little bit uncomfortable for a little while, <laughs> Mild, to put it mildly. The proof of your faith results in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You get to show the world how awesome God is, and that's pretty cool, amen? <laughs> Uh-oh, they're all asleep. <laughs> that's pretty cool, amen? There we go. Hi, guys. Okay. So, and in being shaped, right, like a jeweler just doesn't go along and say, oh, here's this lump of gold. Let me make it pretty and shiny lump of gold, right? No, that doesn't happen. You get rings. You get jewelry, right? It's intentionally shaped to look like something, to serve a purpose, to represent something. A wedding ring represents marriage and lifelong commitment. I'm wearing today my grandma's mother's ring which to me represents something very precious to me, family and heaven and hope and, and a beautiful relationship that I can look to for motivation. So I don't really think very many of us are carrying around lumps of gold in our pockets, right? These are intentional things. The really cool thing about God is that he's shaping us to uniquely help those people around us. He's shaping us through our sufferings to have gifts to bless other people with. And that is amazing. And the thought that came to my mind is when I was in college, I struggled with alcohol. I used it as a coping tool and I drank way too much of it. And I screwed up my life pretty royally and then I got help. And when I was getting help, the lady that ended up being kind of like my mentor, my sponsor, I never officially like went to AA or anything like that, but she, she had gone through AA, and so she kind of counseled me, and her name was Terry, is Terry, and she said to me, we were talking and walking one day, and she said to me, you know, Amanda, I was an alcoholic for 10 years, and if for no other reason than to be able to counsel you right now and to make your life better and if that's the only and to help you and if that's the only reason that I ever went through this that is fine with me and I was not fine with that I was like no that's not a good reason <laughs> that is not okay that is not enough of a reason for you to have suffered what you suffered but it, she had the right perspective she saw that God had uniquely equipped her to help me in a moment when not a lot of people could reach me. I was pretty angry and pretty frustrated, and I was not really talking to God or many other people, and she reached through. She cut through. She got me, and she changed my life. I mean, that was longer ago than I want to admit, and <laughs> she changed me in a very permanent way. And to the glory of God, she impacted my life in a way that I can stand in front of you now. I am proud to say I don't struggle with alcohol anymore. It's not a, it's not a stumbling block. Woo, yay! <laughs> it's not, by the grace of God, it's not something that has any power in my life anymore. And I'm so thankful for that. And it's gone to God's glory. Romans 5, 2 through 5 says, And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's good news, church. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Amen? Amen? Not only that, but we glory in our sufferings. Our what? What? Our sufferings. Because, this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I would put it in every sermon if I could. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance 
character. And character, what? Who knows it? Yell it out. Hope. Hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us, to you, to all of you. We have the Holy Spirit. We get to hope in suffering. We get to hope in the glory of God that someday all this screwed upness goes to God's glory. Amen? That we get to be in heaven with our creator and that everything works out. I'm excited for that. Who's excited for that? Yeah. Woo! So we boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God, in hope. Hope. Hope is a very powerful thing, family. And so we get to call our sufferings joy. We get to call our sufferings blessings in a really weird way. <laughs> um, and it's funny, I was, you guys know I like to tell stories. Um, and I was really trying to, to find a story in my life to tell about suffering. And I was, I was kind of like thinking about it and I was like, I don't, I don't really know, like we've already, you know. Uh. Um, it's funny because some of you know this, not very many of you. So the last couple of years I've really been struggling with my physical health. And I um, just recently was diagnosed with fibromyalgia, which is a terrible disease. <laughs> Because for the most part, you really feel crazy. Um, because your symptoms don't really match anything, and for a while they thought I had MS. For a while they told me it was nothing, that it was just general nerve pain, that there was nothing they could do. And I was going through extreme bouts of pain where I couldn't do anything. And it's triggered by stress. So the more I didn't have an answer, the more pain I was in. And I just really, there were times I really felt like I was losing my mind. I was like, how can this be that it's not anything? All my text, tests kept coming back clean. You don't have this, you don't have that, you don't have this. And I was really suffering. I was, and I was like, what is happening? Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening now? Like, why is there no answer? And I work in the medical field. So to me, I need an answer. Like, when they told me, oh, you have general nerve pain, I'm like, that's not an answer. That's not a thing. Like, I mean, it is, but it's not really. Like, and there's nothing we can do about it. Okay. So I went on a drug that made me all dopey and made me forget things, and it was terrible, and I went off of that, and it was terrible. And in doing all of this, I kind of got caught up in my own, in my own brain, right? In my, the medical part of my brain that was like, oh, you just need to do this test and take this medication and do these things. And, and I kind of left God out of the loop. And it was so much so that I remember one Sunday we had a, a time of prayer and healing. And Scott asked people to come up for prayer and healing. And it didn't even occur to me to go up. Yeah, that's bad. Like, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> I was like so much in my like, I'm going to take care of this and I'm, gonna do, I'm just going to power through and I'm going to get better and I'm going to be fine and we're gonna, I'm going to figure out what this is and I'm going to fight it. Well, that's fine, but it's not really glorifying God at all because I'm over here running on a hamster wheel and God's like waiting for me to wake up. And so I tell that story because now I do consider it pure joy. And it's weird because everybody has been asking me like, oh, are you in so much pain from your accident? Yeah, I'm in pain, but guess what? I'm in pain all the time. Like, it's not really that different. So I've been uniquely equipped to deal with this situation, and I get to talk to you guys today because I have fibromyalgia. Go figure. So <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. And anybody here who's dealt with an invisible illness, whether it's a mental health issue or a, a pain issue or something that's not so visible, you know how it is. You know how it is to have to wake up every morning and fight yourself to have to be able to go through your day. And I have found that to be remarkably easier when I rely on God. Surprise. So... <laughs> So that's what I want to leave you with today, guys. And the verse that we ended up, um, and, or that Scott read, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, when you face trials of many kinds. I think my problem is that I, I got very much in a very specific headspace that God couldn't help me with these things because I had to figure it out on my own. But, you know, and, like, and I go to God with like my, my heart issues, my sadness, my grief, my anger, my whatever. Um, but this medical stuff, oh, I'll take care of that. Mm -mm, don't do that. Uh, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you be, may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. How many of us think we lack in nothing? No. No. Yeah. 
So that's for everybody. And that's where I want to leave you guys today. We're going to talk about some, some stuff here. And really what I want you guys to kind of dive into is suffering, no matter where it comes from, is an opportunity to glorify God. And we're going to break up in groups. And you guys can kind of just meet with the people around you. And there are the questions are over here in French. Um, for those of you that English is not your strong suit, um, Figure out, you know, where have you been avoiding God? Where have, you know, talk about it. Where have you seen suffering in your life and how have you let God use it? How have you avoided it? Because suffering is an opportunity to glorify God, to get to know him better and to reach the world in a way that few others can. My sufferings, the things I've gone through from beginning to now, they equip me in a way that's very unique and there's power in that. There's power in each and every one of you to go into the world and to make a difference in a way that maybe nobody else can. So the question isn't, why is this happening, but how do I respond? How can I find God, and how can I grow? So these are the questions. Break up in some groups, and let's talk about it. Ready? Go. Go.